she has a BSc in Mechanical Engineering from University of Alberta. She is a founding member of the Society of Edmonton Atheists and has been involved with the executive for the past three years. Would that be four years now? Maybe? It is four years. Oh, okay, good. All right. I have the old. One year more. Thanks. Marion was raised in the United Church but has not considered herself Christian since her early teens and acknowledged her atheism in the university after exposure to friends of diverse faiths. She now works with the SEA to create a community of atheists, agnostics, and free thinkers, a safe place for others to voice their doubts and explore their newfound disbelief and the social support traditionally provided by religious uh, institution. And Marion, I want to assure you, you are very safe here, you know, in a Muslim conducted interfaith dialogue. Am I right to uh, just assure her that there is no terrorist here, is it? I know they are all sitting on this side. You know, here. All right, Marion, please. If you could speak a little bit louder, close on that would be perfect. I would try to use my outside. And 
Until something or someone demonstrates the existence of a god to me, I will continue with my life as though there isn't one. Some atheists are 100% absolutely all the time certain that there isn't a god and there can never be gods. Most are fairly certain, you know, if you ask them, they'd probably say 90, 99%, that sort of thing. And some waver back and forth, you may have popularly heard them referred to as agnostics. Atheism is probably as old as theism itself. I mean, we certainly have records of thinkers in classical Greece trying to explain the world in wholly natural terms. And who can know how many people over the year have gone through the motions of faith to avoid persecution or harm or the loss of family. But it's certainly not zero. It's certainly modernly become far more acceptable to refer to some, oneself as an atheist. So the modern atheist movement, which is the reason that the Edmonton Atheists formed, includes the idea that religion should not simply be tolerated, but openly criticized and exposed to rational arguments and scientific thinking. People can come to atheism through philosophy or art or science, or as Dr. Goa mentioned, uh, a distaste and a dislike of, of what the religion they've been raised in stands for, or in my case, asking too many questions. But <laughs> the mandate of the Edmonton Atheist itself is to foster a community through discussion, philanthropy, constructive activism, and education. Discussion, because actively thinking about what you believe and why is important to being able to explain it to other people and to convince yourself that the reason or what you actually believe is justified. Philanthropy is not something that many of our members value and enjoy participating in. Constructive activism because religion has a habit of seeping into public life and politics, and we believe that people should speak up when that happens. And education of the public because many religious people have a distorted view of what it means to be an atheist and why someone would identify as an atheist. So the main topic for this evening is human suffering and religion. And we've heard the previous speakers talk about personal actions and, and sin, and part of that, of course, ties in with morality. So I mentioned earlier that modern atheism includes the criticism of religion. So I hope it's not too surprising then that when I was presented with this topic, my mind turned to how religion causes or allows suffering. From an atheist perspective, there, since there is no God, suffering exists. There is no supernatural direction causing it to happen. It is not based on a past life or someone's, you know, someone we cannot see who is judging us. Religions are man-made institutions. There were no gods involved in their creation holy books were written by normal human beings. So as an atheist, to discuss religion is to discuss how people have built organizations over generations and imbued them with influence, privilege, and power in their lives. But as powerful as religions are in the lives of people or groups, they're still run by people. And like any organization led by people, there's ample opportunity for a few bad apples to organization or a group to think that what they're doing is for the good, even if from an outside perspective it isn't. And like many organizations, it's difficult for whistleblowers to come out to the public and speak about what could be done better within an organization. Dr. Goa laughs. He and I probably have a pretty similar opinion to Western Christianity. But uh, so it's difficult for wrongdoers to come out and speak about what could be changed in their organization and bring it to the light of public opinion. So groups of people are very good at convincing themselves that they are on the right track when there isn't outside, in, outside exposure and outside opinion brought in. You see this in companies, you see this all over the place. In governments, this can lead to policies that don't even remotely achieve what the stated goal of policy is. Uh, or it can lead to a case like the Boy Scouts recently, where years of sexual abuse were hidden and not reported to the police. 
And religions don't escape that trap. I mean, the years of sex scandals within the Catholic Church illustrate that people who think they're doing the right thing, in this case, probably they were thinking they were protecting the church and by not disclosing the abuse and moving the priests to new parishes, it can cause great harm. They probably thought that the good they were doing outweighed the harm, but that's one of the risks of having a small group in power with very little outside oversight. Or, or inside oversight, really. So because religion tends to cover so much of a person's life, their family and friends may be from the same religion, their business contacts, their social support network may go to the same church, it's hard to go public and speak out about abuses or wrongdoings within an organization. And it isn't even made any easier by religious systems that raise people to accept that a religious authority has the ear of God, and that they're also a great moral authority. The entire arrangement discourages speaking up. People can lose their friends, their support networks, and it can affect their job. So religions have the same potential to cause harm as any other man-made institution. And the larger and more revered the organization is, the more potential it has to cause harm. And since large organizations, as anyone who works for one will tell you, they're slow to change. So the harm can continue for decades before any real movement is made to prevent it from happening again. So enough of the structural sort of issues that can results in a religion causing, or at least not preventing, harm. Um, let's talk about sin. So, I was taught that sin is something you've done that offends God. A moral crime, even if it isn't a legal one. And, of course, there's all sorts of things that will fall into that category, depending on who you ask and what their background is. Many religions I say many religions, most of my exposure is obviously being to Western Christianity. Um, teach children early on what is moral and what is a sin in black and white terms. And black and white don't translate very well into a world outside of a religious community once you become an adult. And, which can result in a lot of stress and fear and guilt for some people. Something like the fear of hell, which some religions teach people quite young and use as a threat, can have lingering effects. Even when adult, an adult leaves a religion um, and no longer believes in a god, no longer believes in hell, that sort of fear, it's, it's conditioned, it's emotional, it hangs around for years to affect their life and make coping very difficult. Add in the loss of a social support network when somebody leaves a religion, and you can see how this could have harmful effects on someone's life. Obviously, people can come to some sort of middle ground between the secular moral system they may be experiencing in their day-to-day -day life and the religion they were raised in. They can struggle to maintain the religious moral system even when it doesn't necessarily fit with how the modern world works. Or they can live in a state of cognitive dissonance where they try to maintain the two separate you know, religious and secular moral systems in their mind and pull them out as required for a situation. I spoke last year about secular morality and how a shared moral system can build and support a community made up of people with different backgrounds and different moral systems. And that also ties into suffering. Some things that religions call sin are things that just about everyone should agree on. Murder is wrong. I don't think we need to go holding the debate between religious and secular moral systems to figure that out. But some things that get presented as thin, sins cause more suffering than they prevent. Something that is wrong or immoral, it harms others or it infringes upon their rights. But something like thinking isn't a crime, moral or legal. So some branches of Christianity that say doubt or thinking about sex are sins, it, 
it's inconsistent with secular moral systems like humanism. With, with no God in the picture, who is harmed by a thought? Other sins, such as sex before marriage, don't cause harm to others or infringe upon anyone else's rights. So why would there be a command against it? But a sin starts to look more like something that is just there to control behavior rather than protect other people, it can be cause of, become a cause of human suffering in and of itself. We live in a world where suffering, some suffering at least, is inevitable. We are, will never eliminate all broken bones or the loss of a loved one or natural disasters that cause destruction and mayhem. We'll also never eliminate people who purposefully or inadvertently cause harm to others. But we can take steps to reduce suffering as much as we can. Not through prayer or guarding our thoughts from an observant and touchy God, but through concrete actions taken with an eye to reducing suffering here and now. We can speak up or step in when we observe suffering. We can choose to champion causes that reduce hunger or injustice or preventable diseases. We can accept evidence when it's clear that what we thought was reducing suffering isn't and adjust our strategies accordingly. The urge to reduce human suffering isn't given to us by religion or God. It's something that very young children understand. Anyone with a normal mind understands the reasons to do good in the world and can choose to act on them. Yeah, we, as a community of people who care, should help others to find opportunities to do good and reduce harm. We should work on our shared morality to make the one life that we have as good for as many people as we possibly can. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. <laughs> All right, the uh, actions, if there is the who who sets the accountability code for judgment, who's Conscious is right and who is wrong. Do you get the question that is there any concept of accountability for action? Or what are the reference? What are the standards? Right. So obviously, coming from an atheist perspective, there is no overall God giving judgment in an afterlife for accountability. But humans are social creatures. We live in a community. We interact with other people. We have to live with other people. And you know, we have police, we have a justice system, we have discussions over what laws are appropriate, which ones are not appropriate, what needs to change. There is no hard and fast black and white morality, but we can have a discussion over what is best, what builds stronger communities, what builds healthier communities and happier people. And there is no need for an afterlife to have accountability for these sorts of things. We, uh, other people, are, the people that we are surrounded by and interact with are our accountability. We deal with them regularly. We, um, if we treat them badly, chances are they aren't going to help us as much. This is, this is how communities work. We don't, we don't need some afterlife to give reward or punishment for things done in this life. We can, we can police ourselves. We don't need a God to do it. Thank you. Uh, next question for a uh, speaker from Hinduism. According to Hinduism, if there is a cycle of life, when was atheism made or started? Atheism is not one thing. It has no definite beginning. People come to atheism for different reasons from different places in life. Um, some people are just raised without God and when they become adults, see no reason to start believing in one. Um, 
atheism, there's so many, so many different branches and paths to atheism. Um, before, you know, some people nowadays come to atheism through science, especially if they were raised by a religion that, you know, considers science to be uh, harmful or sinful in some way. Um, a lot of the people in the past came to atheism through the study of philosophy and that sort of thing. Uh, some people have come through to atheism through art and artwork and that sort of thing. So atheism is not one thing. It is some, probably something different to every person who considers himself an atheist, aside from not believing in a god. So atheism has been around since there was somebody surrounded by religious people who said to himself or in public, I don't actually believe all of this stuff that everybody else around me believes. It's, to, it, I can't really tell you when it began because how can you know? Let's tell you again. One of the Psalms. Hmm? It's quite nicely mentioned in one of the Psalms. Okay, I'm in not familiar. One of the Psalms of the Hebrew Scriptures there's a big stick about atheism. Well, let's, let's keep the question the way it is, okay? Thank you. One question for you, again from a young boy. Okay. Do you believe in the last day, end of the world, Armageddon, or anything similar to that? The answer is no. <laughs> well, eventually, the sun will reach a point in its life cycle where it expands and consumes the Earth. That's quite a ways in the future, so <laughs> not really something I think we need to worry about quite at the moment. Um, but in terms of uh, some sort of religious Armageddon or a punishment from some other source, no. But eventually the earth will cease to exist. That, that I have no problem with. Um, whether or not there are humans on it at that point, I guess remains to be seen. It will be quite a ways in the future. Um. Question for Muslim speaker, why are Muslims intolerant in religion and beliefs? Well, you should ask them. 